Okay, so I'll, I'll give a brief introduction on uh, the program on multi-scale modeling. And so Stan already uh, mentioned uh, that that really covers three parts. So I have uh, music, the multi-simulation coordinator, which he briefly explained. Then we're developing a framework for multi-scale modeling. But uh, in this presentation, I really want to emphasize our work on the standard language in neural network modeling. And I have to apologize in advance for the people who attended the workshop on Monday. Uh, there will be quite a bit of overlap between the two presentations. Um, in general, if, if, if one looks at model sharing computational neuroscience, um, there, there are some issues uh, which we, we need to address. Uh, for st especially if you compare the situation in computational neuroscience with that in systems biology. For starters, um, the established journals in computational neuroscience have no policy on model sharing. So the, um, the Journal of Computational Neuroscience has an informal policy to encourage depositing in ModelDB, but there's nothing explicit about that. And, and for example, neural computation doesn't have a, a policy at all. So fortunately, there are a lot of people out there who are convinced by themselves that this is uh, important, and so uh, ModelDB is, is continuously expanding. Um, I already showed you this, this list uh, on Monday, but I know uh, today I want to emphasize another aspect, and that is that if, if you look at uh, the models deposited in ModelDB, that a lot of them are actually um, in programming languages. So we saw Fortran, you see MATLAB, you see Java, uh, C code, and, and so on. So th this is, of course, making the model kind of available, but not in a, in a friend, very friendly form. So if you summarize this, um, so then we see that model sharing in, in computational new science is, is hampered by the lack of an enforced journal policy, but also by the absence of, of a widely accepted standard model description language. And so in, in the cases of the C code and Fortran and so examples, there's usually no separation of execution code and model uh, description. So if you receive this, it's very difficult to analyze and understand what's actually going on. Then um, even if, 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 if it is in, in uh, for example, a model for the neuron simulator, uh, which is at least somewhat easier to understand, you have uh, basically simulator-specific descriptions of models which do not allow you uh, to port them easily to other simulators. And in, in general, uh, this also hampers uh, the development of, of uh, what I would call a healthy software ecology. So th this is a point I elaborated a bit more on Monday, which has been very successful in systems biology, that by using there they have a wide range of specialized tools, not only simulators, uh, so they kind of subdivide the different tasks in which uh, a modeler faces, and they also have a healthy competition among those tools, because it's for the user really easy to switch a tool. So you better have, if you're a developer, you better make it a good tool, otherwise users will, will switch to something else. So in, in, in general, uh, this also uh, makes it much more difficult to really move towards multi-scale modeling in a flexible way. In, uh, I think Stan showed a very nice example of uh, what, what they've been doing in the Lamprey, but I think it's probably a correct description that all these different examples were completely separate from each other. That there is no real, uh, it's not that the, the more detailed model was plugged into the swimming Lamprey, uh, they were developed separately and, and, and have to be maintained separately because there's no infrastructure to really uh, do this across these scales in, in one framework. So the ICF then uh, thought it would be important to address this by developing a standard language. And in planning this, uh, we've really looked closely at the field of systems biology and tried to, to leverage uh, from the success of SBML. So some of the lessons learned from, from analyzing the SBML success were that it's really important that the language is completely simulator independent, so that it actually can foster this software ecology, that it's community-based, 
so that you really involve a, a wide range of, of users and developers and not just a little click with, 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 which decides and everything. And that there is focus. So SBML is very much focused on modeling chemical reactions. And so we thought a bit about what we would do in um, this effort and we decided to really focus on neural network modeling, so uh, spiking neural uh, networks. And partially for two reasons. This is clearly a big growth field in computational neuroscience. So in, we, we address an important uh, part of, of computational neuroscience, but also uh, because it's um, something that has not been that much addressed by, by other existing efforts. And then um, the final point was, was there was not only good points about SBML, but also they, they freely admit that some of the things they did could have been done better. And one of those is really to think your language structure through and really plan that carefully uh, before you actually start doing it. And that has, gives you a number of, of advantages. It, it makes backward compatibility much easier, while at the same time providing extensibility. And in the longer future, it will also make it easier for us to support multi-scale modeling. And so at the implementation level, this then leads to uh, a user, the idea of, of a uh, language with, with layers and, and a very defined grammar. So in, in the final few slides, I, I want to talk a bit about 9ML. So here, uh, so this has been covered in much more detail in, in Monday, but I'll just summarize here uh, some of, of, of the points. So at present, 9ML, uh, which is again is geared toward uh, uh, describing spiking uh, networks consisting of spiking neurons, uh, either Integrate and Fire or Hodgkin-Huxley. Um, has uh, the following features. So it's a layered language with a user layer and abstraction layer. And I'll explain that a bit more in the next slides. It's uh, fully self-consistent, which means that every concept in the language is defined by the language itself. You don't have to go somewhere else to figure out what it really is. And I think that's, that's also uh, quite an important uh, feature. And, um, and it's highly extensible, as, as basically the abstraction layer allows users to define uh, new features which has, have not been included in the standard language and uh, within the overall language framework. So, so that is, is, is also quite an interesting feature. So I told you that it consists of these two layers. So basically one has the user layer and an abstraction layer. And at the level of, of the user layer, uh, this is what users will mostly interact with. And also, this specialized software will largely read directly for, from the user layer. And so there you, you, you define the kind of common concepts people act with, with, with when we think about the models. We have neurons, synapses, populations of neurons which form networks. So you can uh, specify connectivity and so on. But for each of these uh, types up here, the corresponding equations, functions, and, and, and graphs are fully defined in this abstraction layer. So if you have a software like, for example, MATLAB, right, uh, if, if you would want to run this, this, this model expressed in 9ML in MATLAB, MATLAB would actually read this abstraction layer to figure out what it that the far neuron mentioned here really means at the level of equations, and you could then run it in, in, in MATLAB, or, or you know, in, in general, you could use uh, this uh, to, to run it in, in any uh, environment which allows you to solve uh, mathematical equations. In addition, again, if you then come up with a new type of model that no one has thought about before, um, the, you, you can write your equations, express it in this abstraction layer, and actually use it in, in the context of the whole 9ML uh, framework. So this is what, what an abstraction layer uh, definition looks like. Um, it's basically, um, there's a lot of flexibility in there. It's, it's built on, on, on the notion of, of, of graphs. In, in, in different states. So you, in the case of, it's important for indicate and fire models. So they, 
when the subthreshold they're governed by this uh, differential equation, but then you have to detect the threshold, and then potentially then you move in another regime, namely the spike, and potentially also um, a, a period during which you, you cannot spike. Uh, all of this is then described based on math and ML based descriptions of the underlying equations. The corresponding uh, user layer definition of this lo looks something like this. So here you don't see the equations anymore, but for these different uh, parameters which were defined in these equations, you now give values. And you refer to this definition in the abstraction layer by a URL. And so if, if you now talk about software, which, which looks at this, at this file, there are basically two possibilities. One is that this software is a specialized simulator and knows, oh, this is an integrated fine tune. I know how to handle this. I'll just go and, and, and you know, this is already present in, in, my, in my code, so I don't have to worry about anything. I just need to pick up these values. Or if you're MATLAB or, or some program like that, you can actually go to the abstraction layer and figure out what you need to do with this. The, this extensibility is largely based on the concept of nodes, and, and Cheng already explained that uh, on, on Monday also. So for, for all the elements in the language, again, which we reference to by URL, we don't give them fixed names. We just name them nodes, and so that gives you extensibility you can define. If you want to add something, you basically have a new type of node, and, and that's an expressed in the uh, abstraction layer, but you can interact with that at the level of the user layer. And so let me summarize here with then just saying that this is, I think, a quite exciting project that we've been working on for over the last 18 months. It's taken a bit of time to, to really get this task force off the ground, but it's now quite productive. And by the end of the year, we, we expect a first release of 9ML, which will include uh, opposite specification, a user tutorial, support library, a prototype implementation in Python in the Pine environment, and, and several example model descriptions. That latter point, in, in general, the approach taken by the um, task force has been to, within this theoretical framework of fusing abstraction user layer to actually do not do so much a formal design process as to go out and take real models and ask the question, okay, how would I implement this real model in this framework? And build a language based on, on a real uh, field experience, so to say, and, and not on, on, on purely abstract notions, which I think is, is an important point in, in having a product that's actually going to be useful for the community out there. That's it, thank you. Thank you very much, Eric. I think you showed the collaborative effort here, bringing initiatives together, and uh, maybe some elements of standardization as well, depending on definitions. So, uh, would there be questions to, to Eric? I was just looking at the, uh, what you described in the abstraction level and the user level layer. So how crucial are, is it to have, a, you know, how, crucial, how limiting is it to have these layers defined in this way? Because I mean, I'm, as you know, I'm not an expert on this. It seems to be funny to have equations and graphs in the same abstraction layer. You know, they seem to be like different sort, types of things, you know. They don't, you know. So, so well, I, I, I think the, the, it, it's a fairly, so, so most description languages only do what we would call the user layer, right? So, and, and the difference there is, is they would say we have this notion of an in, leaky integrated and fire neuron, and it's defined somewhere else. This could be, in, in the more modern languages, could be an ontology, but, but in a lot of languages it's actually you know, we're just supposed to know what an integrate, leaky integrate and fine neuron was. Everyone knows, right? We don't need to define it. Um, the, so that's our user layer, basically. So you have, you say what type of, of neuron you use, and then you give values for, for the different parameters in, in, in that neuron. Um, the abstraction layer now adds this explicit definition of what this integrate and fine neuron is in a machine-readable form. 
And of course, how you express it uh, depends a bit on, on the properties of what you're trying to, to express. If, like in, in the case of a Hotchkey Huxley model, you just can get away only with ODEs because there are no real state transitions in, in such a model. The case of the integrated and fire model, you really have to have the notion of state transitions, and that's where we brought in graph theory to, to kind of handle those uh, situations. So, but yeah, the, the combination of these different, of graph theory, uh, Equations, so it's just it's just a very practical solution to, to give an efficient machine readable uh, full definition of how you actually solve a particular class of models. Uh, so, using this 9ML, uh, uh, I mean, could we simulate a network of neurons? Yes, that, that, yeah, that's so. So, when I'm going to simulate a network of neurons, say, uh, something around uh, 1,000 plus neurons, if I'm going to use a uh, markup language kind of stuff in for the user ML, and if that markup language is going to stand for each and every single neuron, how much is going to be the amount of information that I need to feed to the simulator that, 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 that's actually a, a very good Wait. question. So, so it has to, yeah, I'll, I'll be short in, in my answer. It, it has to do with, with, with the, the kind of uh, uh, file size problems you get when you do really large scale simulations. So not a few thousands, but let's say hundreds of thousands or millions of, of neurons in your network. Uh, this, uh, we, we're thinking of, of, of um, having an, an additional file format. So an HEF-based file format, which would allow you to, to also describe the, the model in a much more binary and condensed way for, for very large-scale networks, with then a, a completely transparent mapping between the XML and the HDF, depending on, on, on what you prefer to use. Uh, uh, so I think, I'm sorry, I think we have to, to, okay, to move okay. on. Thanks. Okay, so thank you very much, uh, Eric. And